Thank you, Robin. Um, and thank you to like for putting this together again. Um, the point of these sessions is to uh, explain an idea, unpack the idea, and then give you an assignment based on that idea. Uh, we'll be deconstructing some of the ideas around the core goal. For this one, it's diptychs. And then we'll be working on the assignment to produce something original. Uh, the point isn't to produce an amazing standalone piece of work for the, for the sake of it, but it's more a space to experiment and play around with new ideas. So don't go for things you've tried and tested before. Instead, you know, go for things that you haven't done before and hopefully uh, produce results that you're happy with. The assignment for this will be to produce a diptych, which will be a call and response between an existing image that you have already taken from somewhere in your archive and a new image that you're going to take over the next you know, a few hours, or if you're doing this assignment at any point, you know, it can be ongoing. But the, the reasoning behind this is to produce a call and response between something that you've shot before and something that you will be shooting. So a diptych is essentially the most basic form of sequencing in that it's a presentation of two photographs side by side to produce one image. Um, it's almost two halves of one complete whole represent one idea you're using two shots. Um, in this presentation I'll be using examples of diptychs that I've made using my own work. Um, something I've done is I've used the same shot in a few different uh, examples side by side with different things and will demonstrate how work can be viewed in different ways. Um, aside from a few of the diptychs in this presentation they weren't made for any other purpose than for this presentation to educate. So don't read too much into them beyond the point I'm using them to prove. In terms of reading a diptych, you know, really basic stuff. It's about when you present two things together, they'll normally be side by side in one way or the other, which means, you know, horizontally or vertically. Um, as an English speaker, based on the hierarchy of language, you know, I'm reading left to right or top to bottom, which means that similarly, I would hope that um, if you're producing them, know your audience, know what direction they're going to be reading in um, because you can change the meaning of the the final piece based on whether you put important information first or second you know if you think of either of these two images reversed um, the the meaning will change um, it's possible to write them in reverse it's interesting to see how different audiences interpret things differently based on the direction that they read them in um, I think that the above below hierarchy is more universal, so I'm more comfortable making those in a way that I know that anyone who looks at them can understand that they're supposed to be read in that direction, whereas left to right is a little bit less universal, so I'm more careful to balance them out. Um, in terms of the role of a diptych, what a diptych offers. So a diptych more or less draws a line where previously no line existed before so it creates an associational connection between two ideas um, essentially our brains of uh, excellent pattern recognition skills so just by putting two things next to each other we we develop an understanding or we project an association even if there isn't one so doing this effectively means that you can you can force an idea where there wasn't one before um, especially interesting when the visuals are completely different when there's two completely separate ideas maybe black and white or color or completely different compositions completely different themes just by putting them next to each other the the association the connection comes into existence um, another thing that can work through a diptych is that there can be an aesthetic complement in that if two images have a resonance uh, if they share a similar aesthetic then the, probably the most basic form of diptych is that the meaning is based entirely around just how the images look next to each other, as in they look nice, so present them together. Uh, another thing they can do is contrast. That means kind of the opposite is when two images have a bit of tension between each other, when they mean different things, when they represent a conflict, you can push two images like this together and it creates almost a visual, visual argument. Um, this can be used effectively for ideas like humor uh, or you know, conveying a more a more complex or, or a gendered idea. Uh, you can offer context. So one image provides context for the other. That's a useful storytelling tool, which means, you know, you can present a person and then show their space. It can show a space and show a detail within that space. Um, 
it, it leads the audience through to relating a detail to a wider story. It can recontextualize, which means if there are two images where the intent is quite clear, you can apply or assign different context to those ideas by associating them. Um, this would be the a kind of call and response idea, um, allowing the message of one to overpower the other and allow more space for, for someone to read into, into an idea. Um, in terms of characterization, I find that when you photograph people, when you photograph a portrait, a portrait is often very easy just to show what someone looks like visually. But when you present as a set of two, you're representing not just what a person looks like, but a, a deeper character study into that person. So on this slide, there are two diptychs. Two, uh, they both feature the same character, um, which is a, a Buddhist monk. Uh, she works at the, the Buddhist monastery in Milton Keynes. One of the sets shows two angles of her in prayer, and that's one moment um, which just visually shows what they look like. The other one doesn't show her face, but uses a more ambiguous shot. It kind of hints at her character um, and then uses the water to offer another hint to, to maybe show something of the emotional state or the internal mind. When you, when you look at these two together, you have a more emotional showcase, a more kind of poetic interpretation rather than just showing a person from two angles, visually what they look like. You're showing two ideas, two details about what a person could be like. Um, and in terms of punctuation, this is in terms of uh, when you work with a photo series, you're leading from one idea to the next. So if, you, if you've got maybe a photo book, a diptych is very useful to punctuate. Um, you know, it can, it can change the flow to something new or it can bring the flow to a stop. It can take an aspect of topics we were just discussing and lead them to a conclusion or lead to something that will follow on from that. It means that you can lead from one event to the next using something similar, using something you find in each of those events, um, describing one thing, describing the next thing, but the flow stays the same. And it, so it maintains that momentum throughout a larger series. So in terms of the assignment we'll be working on, it'll be to produce a diptych which acts as a call and response. So using the ideas we've discussed, First of all, look through your archive to find an image. It doesn't have to be the best image you've ever made or, or something you're very proud of, but just an image that has something about it. Then over the next few hours, um, in time to present for the, for the review session on Friday, find a, a way to photograph an image that complements that image, that replies to it in some way, that provides you know, a balance in some way based on the ideas we've discussed to that image. Then present them as a diptych. I've sent Robin a template, which hopefully we can distribute. If you don't have that, I can send it to him again. Do you have it? I, I don't. I don't think I do have it. No. Okay, I'll resend it to you. Yeah. And then, uh, essentially, the template is just a Photoshop um, with a smart graphic, which means you can just put both of your images in that. Uh, if that doesn't work for you, then just put them side by side on a document, save it as a JPEG, and submit that. Um, There'll be a Dropbox link distributed. And if you upload to that by 11 p.m. on Thursday, which is tomorrow, uh, a selection of those will be used for the review session. And then also share them on Instagram using the hashtags so that your peers can also feed back uh, where possible. Um, so I'll now do a Q&A. So if anyone has questions, please put them in the Q&A box rather than the, the webinar chat. That makes it easier. Yes, yeah, so there's a question straight away from, um... Vincent or Vincent, your, your uh, preset, you, you present your diptychs by cropping each image to extreme formats. Can you explain why? Yes. So the, the, the diptychs that I create are based on wider frames. If I want the, if I want the wider frame to speak for itself, I'll present it as the frame, but because in my mind, they're becoming something greater than themselves, I'd rather they feel incomplete individually and represent something next to one another. So both of the images on this slide, for example, you know, are slightly wider. There's more of the, of the body of water, there's more of the landscape, but they're not important unless you're viewing it as a print. It's, 
because they're one thing they're allowed to be lesser individually because we're not looking at them individually we're looking at them as a diptych i think that makes sense yeah that makes sense to me um another question whether you want explanatory text um along with the images or is it simply just the image submission no just just the diptych uh, which should be enough of an explanation in and of itself um, because I'll be looking at the way that you know these ideas of punctuation contextualization recharacterization to see which of those might have been applied to see how effective that was um, and to see what can because it's because it's not a because it's not an open-ended assignment like my previous ones my previous assignments have been you know make an image based on these criteria this assignment is to produce an image based on an image you already have. So the first thing I'll be looking at will either be the top image or the, or the left-hand side image. I'll be reading that first and assuming that that's coming from your archive. And then I'll be reading the next image as a response to that. So because that's a very specific way that I'll be interpreting them, I'll expect them to make sense based on that or hoping for them to make sense based on that. Um, great. And another question is with regards to if they're unable to submit images, is it okay for them to join the session? Everyone's welcome at all times. Yeah. yeah so what I would also just add to that is um, on the follow up email that I'll send out after this session, just make sure you do register um, for the review session, even if um, you're not going to be able to make it because that way as well, you'll also receive a recording um, of that session. If that makes sense um there was another question there yeah nick was asking where do you use these diptychs so my my personal uk use case for diptychs are um as a storytelling tool i think that if you can make a diptych you can make a, a set of diptychs so that's four images and then add another one that's five and then when i'm working through a, a sequence of images so for a book or a zine or a gallery presentation i'll be looking at the way they work in sets of five I don't normally go beyond that because it stops making sense. But if you can pair of images that make sense, this pair makes sense, this pair makes sense, you you can eventually you know move through a flow of hundreds of images and they all make sense. So it's a sequencing tool for me. I also think that in terms of aesthetic presentation, sometimes my images make more sense next to each other. So these two, um, the one on the left was shot in Margate, the one on the right was shot in New York. But in terms of the kind of resonance between them, they make sense. So I would present them like this. Um, and uh, just out of interest, do they do you use these images ever as individual images, or do you only use them in a diptych format? I think it can be interesting to go through and find images that have previously made sense as individuals and see what they can do as a diptych. Um, I think it's both. I think some of my images are much stronger as a diptych. I think some of my images, which I've previously thought were strong individually, make sense as a diptych, and I think. Either is valid. It'll always be down to down to your preference. But I think it's I think it's always interesting to see what can be produced. It's always an interesting idea to play with, and um, because I I produce a lot of uh, like small six by four postcard size prints, just laying those out on the floor and kind of shuffling them around, seeing things that appear next to each other is a good way if you're just looking for for that way to draw connections. Um, between previously like disparate ideas um, it's always a good exercise to have even if you previously thought they were good as individuals so yeah um, and I'm not sure if you already mentioned this but you're open to color and black and white submissions. yes um, I think it's interesting two color images two black and white images a black and white image and a color image they're all very interesting interpretations and, and um, are all valid Great. I mean, and also, I guess for those people that there's a couple of um, people that have asked about like submitting text. I mean, you could always during the review, review, you know, write something down in the comments if there is something that you'd like to add. Perhaps. Yeah. So, um, based on the submissions I receive, I'll choose a selection of images, which uh, a selection of diptychs, which won't be the best submissions, but they'll be the ones which are, which will be most interesting to talk about in a review. So if yours does get chosen and you feel that I'm going completely off tangent, then for sure, you know, say something in the, in the chat box and, and um, provide me with context if you've tuned in. Um, 
or you can reach out to me afterwards if you feel that I didn't cover your image well or that I didn't cover it accurately or I didn't cover it at all and you still want me to say something then for sure reach out. Good. But in so, terms of the submission itself, just the diptych. Perfect. Um, yeah, so if there are any more questions, quickly type those in now. Otherwise, um, yeah, we'll wrap this one up and I'll get that follow-up email out to you shortly so you've got all the, um, the details to hand. Okay, I think we're good. We good? Cool. Okay. Oh, hang on, hang on. Which case? Nope, there was no, another one. One Oops. second. Miguel, did I miss your question? Where is your question? Is it in the comments feed? Oh, sorry. That's, aha. Sorry, my mistake. There are a few more questions. Okay, that's right. Just hadn't scrolled down. Right, let's go through these. Okay, we'll need another hour now, I think. I thought it was being a bit slow today, but here we go. Um, I like the image combination of the curvy street, and I also understood the Indian street beggar combined with the Western sleeper. But can you explain some of the other diptychs a bit more? No, they were just produced for the sake of, of complementing the, the point I was making. There was there was not a lot to read into um, in those. They were they were just produced for for educational purposes. Um, I don't think there was there was there was much thought put into them aside from just needing something to, to accompany a slide. Sorry. So, okay. Thank you. Um, actually, that, that, there was somebody else asking about color versus black and white, and you mentioned you can also mix the two. Yep. That's good. Um, when creating a diptych, some relationships that come to my mind are things like commonality, casual, casual, casuality, context from first to second, um, Antagony, what others can be explored? Also, is it important that both images have the as same aspect ratio? So, for my presentation here, I've used them all in the same aspect ratio just because it's, it's a simple visual. You can have a, a, a portrait and a landscape image. You can have a, you know, a 16 by 9 uh, with, a, with a 4 by 3, you know, with a 1 by 1. It's all, it's all fine as long as it makes sense that they are next to one another you know because if they're too far apart or if they're too separate then it feels like looking at two individual images so there has to be some way some connective tissue somehow to to show that you're looking at a diptych rather than two individual images in terms of uh, relationships that can be explored it's it's almost anything it's almost any idea that you could want to look at through a conversation between two images it's it's down to you know what you can imagine it's it's un, it's un, as unlimited as as, uh, as any other form of art. Great. Um, a question from Briony: Should we reconsider things like the rule of thirds or aspect ratios and arrangement when shooting specifically for a diptych? Yes. So certain compositional rules make sense when it comes to the individual image. For me, my, my kind of if I did if I did have a compositional rule, it would be of balance, which is kind of broad but I'm always looking for balance which means that when I'm bringing two images together to make a diptych it's the balance of the overall diptych that matters to me more than the balance of the individual frame so if I'm cropping out things that I previously liked or you know details that I think will be missing then it could be that that image just you know is is a single image whereas if I'm finding an image where there's you know more negative space or areas that can be lost in service of the the whole of the final diptych then for sure, you know, cut them around, re rearrange the the proportions, um, whatever it takes to produce that final image. Perfect, thank you. Um, all examples were monochrome. So I think we've answered that. Um, yeah, that's just my preference for, for illustrating an idea. Um, yeah. There were a few color options I did play with, but I don't think that they that they were useful because I think there would just be more questions about why I chose to use color and black and white than just showing two images. For me, black and white and color serve different functions, which is something I've spoken about in the past. I didn't think that they made sense for, for this presentation, but for sure, if, it, if it's a significant decision for you to make, then make that decision and, and present whatever arrangement of color and black and white you want. Great, and Rebecca is asking, 
Is the diptych a technique you usually, you usually recommend for photo books and maybe portfolios? Are there any other techniques you recommend that help build a powerful narrative? Yes. So in terms of photo books, as I said a few minutes ago, I try and work in sets of five so that you're working through a sequence of five and then the next week's of five and then the next sequence of five. Um, a diptych is a good way to build up that sequence of five. A diptych is also a great way to stand on its own if you've got a double page spread, for example, where you've got two images and they relate. If you've got a single image, a single page, sorry, with a diptych and they relate, it's a good way to, as I said, you know, punctuate or continue a flow or stop a flow. Um, in terms of use for a portfolio, I don't know that it matters as much unless your portfolio is made of diptychs, because to me, a portfolio is uh, almost a highlight reel in which the the narrative presentation makes less sense than the aesthetic presentation unless it's a journalistic portfolio. Um, in terms of other techniques to build a powerful narrative, that's an interesting one because I think that diptychs are best done after the fact. It's not very easy to be in the field, photograph, and then find another image and photograph and know that those will be a diptych. They make more sense when you review a huge body of work and then put them together. I think that building a powerful narrative does have to happen kind of in retrospect rather than in the moment but in the moment the priority should be making as good images as possible as you can with what's in front of you i don't know of any techniques specifically that would build a narrative afterwards that don't involve some wider workflow approach that would take a, a very long time to discuss but i'll maybe look into doing that as a, as a separate webinar Thank you. Um, Steve is asking or is saying photographer Michael Schmidt says that one plus one should equal three. A third invisible has got to impose itself in between. Can you comment on this? If the quote is in relation to diptychs, then I guess it would mean that the, that the whole is greater than the sum of its parts in that you're not looking, is that it, it kind of fades away that you're looking at two images and you're looking at one thing. Um, I don't know that I would be qualified to read too much into, into uh, philosophical photography quotes because um, they, they can be related to anything. Um, but if it's specifically towards diptychs, then yeah, I'd say that it's, that it's important that, the, that the, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. Right. And, um, Laura is asking, what do you think about working with old images? For example, an image from a fam family album that you didn't actually take and then finding a new image to work with that. I think that's a fantastic idea. Um, there are a few photographers I've reached out to to specifically submit work for the review so that I could talk about them, which weren't ideas I've covered in the presentation, but which I think will be good ideas to talk about in review. Um, one of these is a similar concept to you know taking an old image and producing something new or taking an image that someone else shot and producing something your own reply to it so for sure if that's an idea you want to explore um do that and then in the in the in the chat box tomorrow uh, sorry not tomorrow on friday um if i'm talking about your image offer me the context of that and i can i can um discuss whether or not that's been effective perfect um simon's asking if there are any diptych examples that really stand out to you as a great example of the medium. So there are a few photographers who I think produce excellent diptychs. Um, I think Joshua K. Jackson uh, on his Instagram, he often sequences two or more images together and he has a very good way of just kind of the images kind of melt together. And it's just as if you're, you're looking at one, one idea you know very fully um i don't know that there are any specific individual diptychs that off the top of my head i can remember but i know that there are some good photo books that use double double page spread diptychs um and i can get a list of those photo books and provide them for robin to send out afterwards I, I ralph, think ralph gibson I, I find often does it in his photo books Um, Are you familiar with that or not? I, I know a few of Ralph Gibson's images, but I haven't read his book, so I, no. um, I don't know. But if there's any, any that off the top of your head that you think would be worth recommending to people to look at. 
Yeah, there's not this. It's a hard one, actually. There's not actually any that I know of famous diptychs. I mean, certainly not that I know of. I'm trying to think. I think that when they truly stand up, that it's in, in as a storytelling tool. So, like Sebastian Salgado, um, Cartier Bresson. You know, when you read their books and it's been presented as, as a diptych, uh, you know, Winogrand, Myrowitz, you really you're not looking at it to dissect it as all oh, these two images are being presented together. It's more a matter of, for some reason, these images just really work. You know, these pages are great. It's not a, um, it's not a, an overanalyzed part of or aspect of art that I find. So it's, it's interesting to, to have to think about it because it's not something that I do actively think about it when I encounter it. And well, actually, just leading on the same kind of question was from Kaz saying, which photographers are known for working in, in diptychs? So again, I think, I think any, any photographer that's known for working in diptychs is probably a, a weaker photographer because you're thinking about the presentation of the work, not the work. So to name specific photographers, I know photographers who produce great work and produce great diptychs out of that work. So Joshua Jackson, as I said, um, I know that some of Winogrand's work was presented as diptychs, um, but I don't, I, I would have to produce a list and, and uh, provide them to Robin to, to supply in the email afterwards rather than doing it off the top of my head. Um, another suggestion just came in from Vincent saying sequentially yours by Elliot Irwitt. Yes, that is a good one. I do know of that one. Thank you for that. Um, and also Steve recommends Luke Fowler's Two Frame Films book. I don't know if that one, I'll have to look at that one. Yeah, me neither. Thank you for that. And lastly, Brett is asking um, whether there's any criteria guidelines about choosing the image in, in the archive. So, when I produced this assignment originally, we were still in a, in a state of kind of severe lockdown. And the idea was going to be to produce an image taken, uh, you know, in the before times. So uh, crowds, queues, aspects of life that, um, that you, you never thought of or you overlooked. And then suddenly because of the, the situation with the pandemic, you're able to take an image that replies to that, which is how things currently are. Because restrictions have been eased, I, I um, I didn't end up going with that direction, but that was the, that would have been the original criteria. I think for the moment, the criteria should just be an image that you think you'll, you'll be able to respond to easily, essentially just, um, it doesn't have to be a great image. It doesn't have to be your best image. Just any image that you think could represent half of something and then go and find out what the other half of that is. I know that's a bit ambiguous and vague, but I think it's, it's better for the assignment to be that than specific because um, it allows more people to, to participate. Perfect. That's great. I think that's all the questions. Wonderful. So I almost missed about 12 questions there, I think. That's right. We got there. Yeah, we got there in the end. Um, yeah, great. So yeah, thank you very much, Simon. And everyone else, I'll be sending out an email in the next probably 15, 20 minutes or so. So look, look out for that and hopefully see, um, well, a lot of you on Friday again. Cool, yes. Thank you, everyone. And um, yeah, I hope you enjoy the assignment. Cheers. Bye-bye. Cool. Bye-bye.